This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up guys, Michael here, back with another Philosopher Reacts, because once again, some people on TV started talking philosophy. Specifically, I wanna look at critical race theory, or as its friends call it, CRT. It's likely that until a year ago, you'd never even heard of CRT, which refers to a legal framework that's largely been confined to law school seminars. But today, it's hard to turn on the news or scroll through Twitter without seeing videos of people absolutely losing their minds because this academic legal theory is supposedly being used to turn children into Maoist super soldiers. So what is this meeting about? It's about textbooks, books filled with Marxist, communist, racially divisive ideologies. And don't get me wrong, in general, I think it's awesome when names like Marx, Hegel, and Adorno get thrown around in the media. It's a huge improvement over names like Andrew Cuomo, Papa John, and Logan Paul. But in this instance, philosophers are being brought up because their work, which is apparently bad, has influenced CRT, which is apparently very bad. And so the narrative goes, teachers are using these bookish German philosophers to destroy children's lives and undo everything that is glorious and beautiful about America. So today, I'm not gonna philosophically react to critical race theory itself. Rather, I wanna react to some of the rhetoric used by CRT's vocal opponents. Specifically, I wanna ask, do these people really know what they're talking about? So welcome to this edition of A Philosopher Reacts to the Critical Race Theory Controversy and spoilers ahead for dense philosophical texts written in the early 19th century and chaotic Florida school board meetings. But before we get into it, I wanna give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that makes it easier and more affordable for guys to treat hair loss. For most dudes, feeling confident about their hair is a key part of feeling confident about their overall appearance. This means that losing it can be scary for lots of guys. The good news is that prevention is key. And with the right plan, you can keep those luscious locks. You can get started by having a free consultation with a Keeps doctor who can help you get both FDA approved prescriptions and over the counter medications shipped directly to your home. Your hair loss prevention medication will then automatically arrive every three months, so you won't have to worry about waiting in long pharmacy lines as some weird old man coughs in front of you. And you'll have access to your Keeps doctor to ask any questions and keep them up to date on your progress. So find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and why hundreds of thousands of men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention by checking them out today. If you're ready to take action to prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash wisecrack or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. Let's start by establishing what CRT is. Two of the theory's founders, Richard Delgado and John Stefanczyk, define the term as a radical legal movement that seeks to transform the relationship among race, racism, and power. The theory, mostly taught in law schools, investigates the historical impact of structural racism and equality built into the American legal system with the intention of making those systems less racist and more just. This all seems pretty reasonable, considering that it wasn't that long ago that black people were legally considered three-fifths of a person, and even today, black men are sent to prison on drug charges at rates 20 to 50 times those of white men. And importantly, their key texts don't mention infiltrating elementary school curriculums to make your white child hate them. Himself. And yet, this legal framework has taken on huge political overtones. Judging by the media response, you would probably think CRT is philosophy gone wild. But in actuality, critics of CRT have tried to use mischaracterizations and or willful misreadings of some of the most important philosophers in history to try to prove that CRT is part of some violent and scary intellectual legacy. Let's see how they do it. So the first philosopher sacrificed at the altar of the anti-CRT agenda is friend of Wisecrack, George Hegel. Let's hear from one of CRT's biggest critics and a self-professed expert on the topic. I am recognized as a kind of world level expert in critical race theory. This guy did a four hour podcast on how Hegel is at the root of wokeism, a made up word that describes a dangerous intellectual trend of which CRT is supposedly a key aspect. Side note, it's pretty f***ed up to record a four hour podcast. The only four hour podcast I would listen to is one where Bobby Flay talks about each of his failed marriages in great detail and then shares a recipe that reminds him of each one of his ex-wives. But here is how this world renowned expert on all things CRT describes Hegelian philosophy. Secondly, this dialectic is a method of worship in a broad religious movement that started primarily with Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel in the early 19th century. Okay, um, 
That's just not, that's not right. Um, the dialectic, which he's talking about here, is a method of logic as clearly laid out in books like The Phenomenology of Spirit and The Science of Logic. Thinking dialectically basically means that things are considered in relationship to their opposites. Hegel uses this to understand both human consciousness, philosophical logic, and natural phenomena. And while I've read thousands of pages of Hegel in my short time on this dying planet, I never saw any sections on the call to prayer. Next, this guy refers to Hegelianism like this. This crappy line of thought, this crappy religion, as it's come down for the last 200 years, ultimately from the metaphysics of Hegel, which we'll get to a bit further down. Even if you disagree with some of Hegel's massively influential ideas, Crafty feels a bit extreme. And while one of Hegel's early texts, The Spirit of Christianity and Its Fate, was indeed about religion, his whole project at that point was about identifying a logical system within Christian theology. The last thing Hegel wanted to do was turn philosophy back into religion. If anything, he wanted to find the philosophical core of religion. But what does this have to do with your niece Miffany and her radical communist teachers? This is how they teach it. This is the, what their goal is to teach children to think dialectically because that's the engine of their worldview that's how they think about the world okay um so here this guy's drawing a line from hegel to crt via critical theory which we'll get to and then from crt to your local elementary school he's arguing that teachers are teaching children how to think dialectically and that considering issues from a dynamic perspective is making kids woke or something and lest you think this is a rare occurrence in the public education system he keeps going. So the dominant mode of education in the West today seeks to teach our children the Hegelian dialectical mode. Okay, so genuinely, I, I know many of our wonderful viewers are teachers. So if you're out there, please let us know in the comments if you would characterize the dominant mode of education today as the Hegelian dialectical mode. Now, I spent much of my childhood in the sketchy hands of the Florida public education system, and our curriculum was never about how concepts contain their own opposites and how that makes them alive, but uh, maybe I missed that day. But to give this guy the benefit of the doubt, let's see what he thinks Hegelian dialectics is and how it functions. You know, I might say that the sky is blue, and a straight negation of that would say, no, it's not blue. Or you maybe would negate by implication by saying it's green, or it's red, or it's some other color he loves colors but an alf haven would say not at night or maybe even not when it's raining and so it has this feeling of deliberately missing the point so you get to keep the blue like you didn't actually tear down the blue you get to keep it but at the same time you've torn down you've abolished the concrete sense that the idea was right in the first place so now you have to reach this synthetic view of the sky that's more complicated benefit of the doubt season is officially over um the guy is is clearly misinterpreting hegelian dialectics which is to say the logical framework that hegel uses to understand literally everything so he calls green a negation of blue which is philosophically speaking bonkers just as the ocean. And while he does get really close to accurately describing Hegelian thought, he then laughs it off as intentionally missing the point. Now see, for Hegel, concepts contain their own negations internally, which means that something is both itself and its opposite. Think about the last cute baby you saw. That cute little thing contains the possibility of one day being a disgusting old man that smells like lukewarm soup. So you can't just understand a human for what it is right now, but for what it can become. Now, Hegel develops this idea of, of being as becoming by noting that being is always accompanied by its opposite, nothingness. Which basically means before anything comes to exist, it didn't exist. And after it ceases to exist, it will no longer exist, so being and nothingness are necessarily related. For Hegel, this showed that concepts are alive marked by an internal tension that keeps them moving forward. If this sounds confusing, don't worry, it is. So I might say the sky is blue, but if I sit and watch it all day, maybe or maybe not because I'm on mushrooms, the sun sets and the sky is now not blue. It didn't stop being blue because some contrarian asshole said, well, actually the sky is technically black, but because the sky itself changed from blue into black. And through my observations, I see that the sky isn't just blue or just black, but a process of becoming that moves between a thing and its opposite. But uh, I guess this isn't straightforward enough for our guy. But Michael, you're probably thinking, did you really have that realization while on mushrooms in the park? 
And also, what in the f does this have to do with critical race theory? I'm glad you asked. First, Yes, I did. Second, the argument is that because this is how Hegel's philosophy works, and because CRT is basically just repurposed Hegelianism, which it is not, and because schools are dominated by a CRT curriculum, that children are being taught to think like 19th century German philosophers. And if elementary school teachers were Hegelians, they would teach kids to observe a concept or natural phenomenon as a living thing that can't simply be reduced to what it is upon immediate observation. I, I, don't, I genuinely struggle to see why anyone who actually understands Hegel's philosophy would be worried about kids learning it. But, but honestly though, Hegel is super hard and your average booger munching third grader would have a difficult time understanding it, much less being radicalized by it. I struggled with it as a booger devouring grad student. But the Hegel stuff is important because it leads into the name that gets thrown around most when talking heads on TV try to turn CRT into the biggest boogeyman since the first NWA record. The old Marxism used economics to gain control. The new Marxism, the new Marxism uses identity politics. And the result is something that looks nothing like America. That's right, Karl Marx. Here's how one CRT hater describes 19th century philosophy's edgiest bad boy and his influence on CRT. The tenets of CRT are openly Marxist theories with the word race inserted. Marxism is a destructive political philosophy that has never succeeded for a single country on which it has been imposed. In fact, Marxism has eventually ruined every society coerced to accept it. So this is, uh extreme? First of all, it's not fair to say that the tenets of CRT are openly Marxist theories with the word race inserted. That's because Marx wasn't a legal theorist and his writings, which were largely focused on economic systems, bear little, if any, resemblance to the key text of CRT. And the whole Marxism as a destructive political philosophy stuff is weird because Marx was very overtly not telling people how to do a revolution. Rather, Marxist thought was grounded in an analysis of the working class in 19th century industrial Europe and how industrial capitalism was rife with internal contradictions. Like how the captains of industry make more money when they pay workers as little as possible, but then also depend on workers having enough income to buy their products in the first place. If this writer was genuinely interested in evaluating the validity of Marxist thought, he would maybe consider how well Marx's analysis of capitalism, commodification, and labor explain recent economic and political events. But of course, this is all besides the point, as this isn't really telling us anything about critical race theory. And while I'd love to rant some more about this, instead, let's see what Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the founding scholars of CRT, has to say about the supposed Marxism behind her legal theory. Is critical race well, theory Marxism? Look, you know what? Here's, here's the thing, Joy. Um, critical race theory is not so much a thing. It's a way of looking at a thing. It's a way of looking at race. It's a way of looking at why after so many decades, centuries actually, since the emancipation, we have patterns of inequality that are enduring. They are stubborn. And the point of critical race theory originally was to think and talk about how law contributed to the subordinate status of African Americans, of indigenous people, and of an entire uh, group of people who were, were coming to our shores uh, from, from Asia. Um, and the point was, quite frankly, to understand the problem in order to intervene in it. Okay, well, there you go. Um, but there is at least one more stop on this bizarre philosophical safari, 20th century critical theory, AKA the Frankfurt School. And this one is a bit more complicated than the Hegel and Marx stuff, because CRT is explicitly influenced, at least in methodology, by critical theory. I mean, it's, it's kind of right there in the name, you know? So why are people so scared of critical theory? A philosophical tendency that considers dominant institutions and schools of thought in order to affect social change and realize intellectual emancipation. Well, let's ask this totally mellow seeming person to explain it to us. So if you trace the history of critical race theory back to where it originated, if you take it uh, not just to critical legal studies, but all the way back to critical theory, um, which is a theory that was created at the Frankfurt School by Marxists at the Frankfurt School back in the 1930s, um, you see that this isn't really a perspective on history. This isn't really a theory at all. It's actually a tactic used to, uh, with the intention at least, to start a Marxist revolution. But instead of Karl Marx's vision of a worker-led revolution, those adherents to critical race theory 
uh, teach a sort of racialism to use racial minorities in our country uh, as a vanguard to spark a, a Marxist revolution here in our country. They do that, as the name would suggest, critical theory, by relentless criticism of the institutions in our country, hoping to undermine them, tear them down, so that they can replace them with Marxist institutions instead. Okay, um, now this one is actually funny because, if anything, the members of the Frankfurt School pretty overtly thought that a traditional Marxist revolution wasn't gonna happen in the 20th century and that culture was a better site for struggle than the factory floor. These weren't necessarily radical militants. They were bookish dudes who had to escape Germany during World War II so they could keep doing their work at American universities, which makes the idea that their thought leads to fascism ironic, but I digress. Luckily, our buddy James from before has some thoughts on the damage caused by critical theory. So, so let's see what he thinks about this one. So actually we don't have agency under critical race theory or any of its philosophical right. antecedents. So this agency stuff misses the point. Critics act as if critical theorists and critical race theorists alike think human beings don't have free will or agency, and that, for example, a white child named Jackson is gonna be racist simply because he was born into white privilege. What this really means is that the way we think is shaped by dominant structures in society. It's like how I grew up with a father who was a huge Chicago Cubs fan. So I became a fan myself. I wasn't overtly coerced, but the structures of Cub fandom in my childhood home influenced how I saw the world. If I had a dad who was a huge Houston Astros fan, that likely would have influenced me just as much, which would suck because they're filthy cheaters. And while this is harmless when it comes to baseball teams, it's super harmful when the influential structure is racism or fascism. For the critical theorists, both capitalism and fascism were the bad types of structures that needed to be called out. And for critical race theorists, it's the legal system that needs to be criticized. But just because a structure exists doesn't mean we're robots stripped of our free will. Instead, it means that the structures that surround us influence how we experience the world whether we notice them or not. As noted bandana enthusiast David Foster Wallace, who was a philosophy major and PhD dropout would say, it's the water. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? Just a really good point right there. <laughs> Encouraging people to think critically about dominant structures, to define water, if you will, is philosophy at its finest. It's literally what got Socrates killed. And if Socrates is a bad guy now, I'm done. I'll spend the rest of my days rewatching Curb Your Enthusiasm and eating chicken fingers until my sad heart finally gives up. So again, the whole point for all of these critics is that CRT, which is supposedly a dialectical Marxist critical theoretical hellstorm is being used by teachers to either make kids hate themselves or to start a revolution led by soldiers who are three years out from getting their learner's permits. So here is what Kimberly Crenshaw thinks about this. Is there a K through 12 curriculum on critical race theory that's being taught in schools around this country? Well, look, Joy, if it was news to most Americans that critical race theory was in K through 12, it was news to me, too. I'm one of the co-authors of one of the few books on critical race theory. I think I would know if we were being taught in K through 12. OK, so that's pretty clear. If it was being taught in schools, Crenshaw and her colleagues would probably be getting some great royalty checks. So by now we've established how a lot of the philosophy being associated with CRT is either being mischaracterized or has little to do with CRT in the first place. So let's quickly consider CRT's actual relationship with philosophy. It does build on the foundations of critical theory to question dominant structures and values in the American legal system. And overlapping with some of the scary Marxists, it uses an analysis of culture and dominant ideologies to consider how the legal system reinforces racist and sexist ideas. And regarding the biggest enemy of angry parents up and down the phallic Florida coastline, Karl Marx, who famously said that the point of philosophy wasn't just to understand the world, but to change it, CRT is a method of analysis that aims to then engage in activism to correct systematic injustice in the legal system. But luckily for all those scared Tampa parents worried that their son Rachery was being recruited into a revolutionary cell group by their social studies teacher, CRT is focused on making the legal system way less racist and not violent 
violently overthrowing Western society. So CRT has a relationship with philosophy that's no different than what you might find amongst contemporary art theorists or literary critics. Also, it's not taught in schools, and no offense to your brilliant third grader, they probably wouldn't understand it if it was. So why is everyone so mad? Well, it's partially because they don't really seem to know what they're mad about. When one of the critics of CRT actually speaks to someone who knows their about CRT, critical theory, and Marxism, this happens. Okay, so, and it, of course we're running out of time, but I'm gonna respond just so the audience and the people who watch this on clips don't think that Please. I don't have a response. First of all, sure, sure. The, 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 your, your counter is predicated on the idea that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between critical race theory and critical there's theory not. as sort of produced from the Marxist tradition, from the Frankfurt School, etc. when in fact, critical race theory has certainly connections to any kind of critical uh, intellectual discourse, but it's also connected to critical legal studies, which was not committed mm -hmm. to sort of inheriting all of the all of the kind of uh, 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 Gramscian and Marxian sort of ideas that you're talking about. And as far as sort of structures that, the, the, again, you're, you're making a connection between structures in terms of institutional structures that I was talking about and the particular type of structures that, say, a Saussure would be talking about in terms of structuralism. That's not actually what I was talking about. And that's not what most people are talking about when they talk about systems and structures. Again, that's a very tight correlation. It's a draw, breath of fresh air after everything else we've seen. Then sure. But it's, it's not only that we're not accepting it. It's actually not what we're talking about. And postmodernism, yeah, again, plays this, upon actually. a range of things. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said, you know a lot about you. this, actually. <laughs> you know a lot about this, actually. Um, yeah, he does. So for better or worse, the moral panic around CRT is a whole lot of nothing. And it's about as grounded in reality as that underground bunker your dad built to prepare for Y2K. Seriously, though, it's basically just a sad example of people trying to induce panic by throwing out the names of dead German philosophers they've never read. And most upsetting to us, it's used this panic to criticize the most important people in any democratic society, teachers. But what do you guys think? Are the spirits of dead philosophers working through critical race theorists to infiltrate schools and destroy the minds of America's youth? Or are many Americans just deeply uncomfortable with the fact that our country's history has not been all happy parades and Super Bowl halftime shows? Let us know what you think in the comments. And definitely let us know if there's anything else out there that warrants a philosophical once-over. And if you're curious about some of the texts and philosophers I talked about in this video, uh, there's some follow-up readings listed in the description. Thanks as always to our awesome patrons. Smash that subscribe button like you're pulling the fire alarm at a chaotic school board meeting and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later. Just like be a grown up and call it man.